originally dyed with cochineal, which is the bug. And they were reds, various reds. And then I over dyed them with indigo. You dip them in indigo and then you get these colors. The colors are just gorgeous. Aren't they lovely? They really are. Really and they're harmonious because they all went into the indigo, even though they were different. This was dyed with Brazil wood, which produced these colors on this red piece. And the green was originally this color. And it was dipped in indigo because you cannot get green from nature. This is the dye book. Marigolds are local. Cochineal is imported. Was in colonial times and it still is. It, the bugs can't live anywhere where there's a frost. Onion skins, of course, local. Indigo is imported. Was imported in colonial times and still is. Brazil wood was imported. It's wood chips. Logwood was imported. Matter, they can't find any evidence that it grew here. I buy it from a dye supply. Cota is this, this, and they're not, it's not yellow. This is more yellow. Cota is very local and it's everywhere. Indian paintbrush, yeah. It's almost a champagne color, and the, the attractiveness of this is that it blends with anything. Snakeweed is very local. It's blooming now, and I will harvest that. It's a wonderful yellow, but when it's over dyed, you get these wonderful greens. So you get the whole rainbow of color. You've got all the yellows, greens, blues, purples, oranges, and reds. Thank you so much for explaining that. Well, you're very welcome. Fascinating. Churro wool is a double-coated fleece, which means that the outer hair is long, like mohair, very silky, very strong. The inner fiber is very soft. The two together are carded, and so you get a lustrous, but also a very soft yarn. And that's one of the characteristics of, of churro. That we don't want in there. In New Mexico, the churro, like most things, either thrive or they die. And they do very well with very little water. And in an area where water is so precious, you didn't need a great deal of it to process the wool. I add hot water to the washing machine. It should be the hottest tap water. And then you add Dawn. I don't measure, I just see what color the water is. It needs to be a blue. And you don't want to agitate the water, you don't want to create suds because that will mat the yarn. So you just soak it. It's called scouring and it removes the debris from the fleece. It's been out in the open air, so there's dirt, there's bits of, who knows what, debris of some sort, like here. And then there's lanolin. Lanolin is the natural grease that is on the fleece. After it washes, this, this stays soaking. It doesn't really wash, it just soaks. It stays in here for an hour, and I time it, because the water will get cold, and when it does, then the lanolin clumps up, and you don't want that. When the hour is up, I put it on a spin cycle, and all of the water is removed. And then I remove the fleece, add more water, only to the second one, I add hair conditioner. The hair conditioner will remove all of this excess soap, excess detergent. It soaks for another, oh, 45 minutes to an hour in hot water. Spins, and for the third time, the rinse is um, with drops of pennyroyal oil, which helps to deter moths. They don't like it, and it makes it smell good. And that's the process. Once that's done, I take it out, and then I spread it out right here, actually. And then I come periodically during uh, the day and the night and just turn it over. And then it becomes very fluffy and 
um, when it finally dries, then it's ready for carding. When I use the cards, first thing you do is load the carder. And that just means put hunks of the fleece on the carder. You take the other carder and you sort of comb it. And after a while you will see that it has a direction. It's like combing your hair. You remove it from one comb, turn it around, and you do it again. When you see that it's pretty straight, you load one carter, it just comes off easily. It makes a roll, that's a roll like. And when you spin, you start at this end and everything's all lined up. And if it's properly combed, then you get this wonderful, consistent yarn. Basically what you're doing, I'll slow down. This is twisting. You pinch it to prevent the twist from going into the rest of it. And so it's a process of pinching and pulling. Pinching and pulling. It's a very meditative process. It's a very quiet process. I could just as easily use commercial yarn and commercial colors and just weave with it, but I choose not to because I want to honor the tradition. And in fact, I had several ancestors who were stocking knitters who lived in this little community and probably walked this land. So in a way, I feel connected to that. The signature on all of my pieces, actually, is a little stocking. And it's a tribute to these early ancestors. Once the spindle is full, you just slide it off of the spindle you use this little tool. There's a hole there. And then you go inside and you add it to the skein. And all you're doing is going in a circle. And these ties are in figure eights. It keeps the yarn from tangling. So there are four figure eights. And then it's removed. And then you twist in the opposite direction. That goes that way, this goes this way. And then one fits inside the other. And there you have a skein. In order to have the yarn adhere to the color, you need to have a mordant. It's a kind of a binder. And the mordant that I use is alum and cream of tartar. Alum is a natural occurring salt. Um, it's found after a rainstorm and the puddles uh, evaporate and it's these crystals around the edge. I buy it commercially, I don't go look for it. And cream of tartar is a substance that softens the wool and allows the color to adhere evenly all the way through. And this is a byproduct of winemaking, and that I buy commercially. So you have a container of water, and you have a pot of water that you're boiling. You weigh your yarn. A hundred and six grams. So 10% of that is 10.6, so it'll be about almost 11 of alum. And then 
cream of tartar is 5%, so it's half of the previous one. So if I used 11, now I will use 5.5. Now the skein is soaked in warm water or hot water. You undo it and this usually gets soaked for a good half hour or so so that it's saturated. And then you have your big pot of water boiling and then you add this solution to the pot. Stir it around so that everything dissolves and then you add the skein of yarn and you Simmer it for an hour or so. When it is finished, you wring it out. Perhaps put it in a plastic bag if you're not going to use it right away. And then the next day I usually put it in the dye solution and let it go. The whole process is a connection to what came before me. Our ancestors did this, and the women, it is said, did the spinning and preparing of the yarn during the winter when it was cold, and they did the dyes. When they're in full bloom, they're ready to pick, and these show that some of them are drying out, so those I don't want to use. They're not as vibrant. And these I can either use fresh, or I can hang them up to dry. I tie them and then I can hang them from a nail and they'll dry so that I can use them when they're dry and in the middle of the winter when, I, when these are no longer fresh. So that's, that's a nice little crop. I'll have probably enough for two dye sessions. I use rainwater because it's soft and the pH is neutral, whereas my uh, well water has a lot of minerals in it, and it changes the color. So for more intense color, I use the rainwater. And this water goes into the pot with the snakeweed. And usually I let it soak overnight, and then the next day, I'll simmer it. So this goes on the burner. It simmers. You can already see that the color is being extracted. It's kind of a un uninteresting yellow. So here's my dye stuff after it has simmered and it's cooled off overnight. And then the next morning, it's ready to be poured off. This is strained, and the liquid that remains is what becomes the dye. And I use a solar oven, which is just this. It is designed to capture the sun's rays. And even in the middle of winter, when it's freezing cold, as long as there's sunshine, I can dye. This is yarn that has been pre-treated with alum and cream of tartar. So that goes into the pot, and then it simmers all day. This becomes a kind of a, an airbag. The solution can get as hot as 160, 180 degrees, which is pretty hot. It doesn't boil, but it does simmer and it's the slow simmer that gives the intensity of the color. After it takes on the color, then I dry it. I will wash it, and then it'll be ready to be used in a project. And the process that I have gone through with the snakeweed is the same process I would use with all the dye sources. You either grind or dry or soak, or all of the above, and then the solution, you simmer, and then that's what becomes your dye source. 
And the intensity of the color depends on how much dye you have in there, how much dye plant. If I wanted this a bit darker, I might, I might use more. Um, the mordant that we just used, cream of tartar and alum, is used for all, all yarn to adhere the color. And the only ones you don't use it with is indigo and cochineal. This is an example of matter. Matter is a root. And it's processed uh, to extract the color like a tea. And then you use, you boil it. Um, and then you dip your yarn in there that has been treated with a mordant. And you can get a range of colors like this. You can also do this. This is a jar of rusty nuts and bolts. If I treated this skein with this solution, you end up with something like this. So instead of just having two colors to work with, then you'll have this harmonious blend of colors to use in your piece. Mm -hmm.